Um, essentially, uh, and you know, we're struggling with this at the moment because I, I co-lead uh, the IPCC group that's looking at this question uh, of, of adaptation and integration, especially in cities. Uh, I was making a very brief point in that paper, and that is that you know, you know, climate is going to be a very serious question. Most of us are going to be become be dead, I guess, by the time that we move from climate variability to change, because that will happen over the century. Uh, but for those of our children and grandchildren who are left, we are in we are in deep, very very deep trouble. I mean, we are in trouble uh, because we are going to see uh, certain. Um, you know, there are some questions about it, but we are going to see dangerous climate change, uh, which means that we are absolutely going to go beyond 550 ppm. Uh, we are going to have uh, you know mean temperature rises of over, over two degrees. Uh, so the very limited point that I was trying to make in that paper was that as far as India is concerned, because you know, we still have a large population of people who are poor. That's going to continue for a large part of the century. Uh, is Can that you hear him? Uh, no. Sorry. Let's not. Yes, it looks like it's a I, can, I can speak a little louder. So basically what I was saying is that as far as India is concerned and, and as far as climate is concerned, um, we have no choice but to plan for adaptation. Mitigation is a, is a remarkably important thing both for us and for the global community. But we don't have much choice. And you know, I've, I've worked with risk for many years and we've seen this in many places uh, across the country. So this the very simple uh, you know, idea that we're working with is that if we want to implement this thing within the frame, framework of the amount of resources that we have and the capacities, we have to sort of bring together three different agendas. The development agenda in which we are spending hundreds of thousands of crores and doing a whole range of things. Um, the uh, climate agenda where Potentially, there's a lot of resources that are coming together in some innovation, and the risk agenda. You know, every few years, and we've seen this at least over the last decade. Uh, there are extreme events that happen, and there's a response to the extreme events. So, if you bring these three things together, and you know, the, the estimates are they probably would be something of the order in each probably in, in each plan period of about fifty thousand to hundred thousand crores that go in, into all these processes. If you bring these these three agendas together, you can actually do a lot more much quicker. Uh, than by sort of trying to raise resources internationally or otherwise. So the resources are there, you have to redirect them. So that was a you know, very, very simple idea. So I'm not saying that we don't have to mitigate. We absolutely have to mitigate. We have to deal with consumption. We have to deal with the overall uh, efficiency of our systems and throughput, etc. Uh, but um, for most people in this country, adaptation is the only choice that uh, we will see. And hence, it will become a politically salient question. But I will sort of move away from that and maybe respond to, I think, a, a very uh, important set of questions that uh, Anilji has raised. And I, you know, if I present it in a slightly historical perspective, um, you know, when we talk of national innovation systems, and I worked a little bit on in, the, in that space, uh, we forget, or we often forget, that both the state, and you know, we talk of it in a fairly status perspective, we see, as the state sees it, we see almost now, as we've become more and more globalized, as the firm sees it. Both the sort of modern nation state and uh, the firm are, are relatively recent innovations. They're about 400 years old. Uh, and what we heard from Anil today was about a whole system which is much, much older than that. In fact, it's a layered system starting with agriculture and a whole range of other things. So I think that's the thing that we have to sort of understand and accept that fundamentally uh, it, that, that is a system we're talking about. So when we're talking about the nation and citizens, uh, looking at, at, at sort of as, as people like exogenous is, uh, I, I think, a huge mistake, and especially in the 21st century, uh, as I said, with, with younger people who are continuously connected, you actually have the ability here of distributed systems to transform and change things very, very rapidly. So there is a new opportunity that technology has brought. That technology, of course, is coming from the state and also from, from, from <coughs> let's say, from the firms who stylize it. Uh, but that's, I think, a, a, a fundamentally different opportunity. So if you don't see it in that context, I think you, you often get confused. So the real opportunity for, for India, I think, is to actually build on that. And you know, I link that with, with another set of facts, which, again, is not often known. Uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, India today, we have about, current census, something about 8,000 urban centers. but we have about 5.5 lakh, let's say about six, or four, yeah, for round, round numbers, about five, five lakh, five and a half lakh, six lakh villages. So the core question for us in terms of structure, because very often we think of these things as aggregates, but actually when we're looking at these distributed systems, you have to look at them spatially. And I just focus on that idea. 
The question is, in 2050 or 2060, when India's population peaks out, so we will peak out at 1.5, 1.6 billion, there's, you know, there's the dynamics that's involved in that, but broadly those are the numbers that we can expect. The question is, what is the spatial structure going to be like? And this is a deep, you know, this is a deep sort of uh, question that many of us fi fight about uh, academically. But the point is, given the orders of magnitude, so you have 8,000, let's say, just to do the numbers in your head, you have, let's say, 10,000 urban centers, but you have uh, 5 lakh uh, villages. What will that structure be like, I think, is a very central question. So in the academic debates, in a sense, what we're saying is the number of urban centers may go up to 25 to 30,000. Uh, but the question is, how much does the number of rural centers come down? Because, you know, as you build out your roads or... Uh, technical infrastructure for ICT, etc., etc. The numbers expected to come down, but the order of magnitude will not change. So again, the debate is whether it will be 200,000 or 300,000. But the fact is, even when you peak out, and remember, when we peak out in, in 2050, we're still going to become, in technical census, in the current definition the census provides us, 50% urban and 50% rural. In fact, it, the urban may be slightly less than that. Okay. And this is something which, which completely, and this is, again, I said, something pe people don't know. South Asia is very, very particular. It's completely different from any other part of the world. It's different from Europe. It's different from Northern South America. And it's different from where China is currently going at the current point of time. So we will have a structure in 2050, a population structure, where about half the population uh, will or more will be in, in these distributed settlements. So to us, of course, if you take the conventional paradigm, and I think, you know, coming down to development paradigm questions there, uh, where you see yourself, the conventional sort of Rostovian, New Kuznetsian framework deals with a population which sort of terminates at 5% of the people or 10% at the most in primary production. Okay, I mean, that's, that's the aspiration. So most primary production or the primary sector goes down that because it's driven by an energy system. You have a large number of people in the service sector and you have a significant number of people in the manufacturing sector. So there's a big question of economic structure. But that economic structure is also related to a spatial structure. And historically, what we've seen happening, uh, especially in the hyper-urbanization of Latin America and, and also in North America, is that has been driven by a concentration of energy resources, which have enabled that to happen. Uh, that is no longer possible anymore for climate reasons. The climate space, the amount of carbon space that's available, will not allow that to happen. So what does that mean? It means that because of our lack of development, within quotes, because of the mistakes that we have made, we're actually left with a, with a mid-century spatial structure that corresponds to a very different regime of production. So most of the technologies that we're talking about of the 21st century, the, the, the really critical ones, are network-based, whether it's agricultural systems, or it's energy systems, or it's water systems. They're all about decentralized production and consumption. So our spatial structure actually maps onto where the technologies will be in the mid-century. Okay? So the question I have then is, uh, how will uh, seeing like the state or seeing like the firm be able to deal with those opportunities? Because that came from an era in which energy and resources uh, were relatively plentiful, where closed loop cycles were, were, were not necessary. But in a world where we absolutely know that we've gone beyond global biocapacity and this country has gone beyond our biocapacity limits 10 or 15 years back, uh, we actually have a huge opportunity. And I think it's not only uh, in looking at different trajectories and how the NIS will work out, etc. But it is actually leveraging on this opportunity of where the innovation is happening. And that's why I said, you know, if we can think of, of young people across the country and the way it works in a distributed network-based infrastructure, and, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, in spite of the scams, 3G is on the table. Uh, and 3G is what in, is one of the ways that we will enable this connection. But 3G itself is not enough. Uh, language, for example is one of the most important barriers because we create and, and build knowledge in particular languages, both of science or formal otherwise. But natural languages are a significant, significant challenge. And I know that because, you know, for two years we've been trying to build this new university. And our hope is that we will actually be able to deliver bilingually uh, or in more than one language because that is the fundamental barrier to, uh, to innovation aggregation uh, from distributed systems otherwise. So something remarkable, and that's what I think is done extremely well uh, with Honeybee, etc. A remarkable innovation is happening in Kerala. How do you transfer it uh, to, to uh, in Guwahati? Or something that's happening in Mizoram that may be really applicable to what, what's happening in, uh, let's say, <coughs> in JNK. How do you enable that? And, and the language barrier is a very serious one because we don't actually transcreate and, and, and build in that. So I'll sort of, I'll, I'll leave you uh, 
with those ideas. Uh, there is another thing that, that really disturbs me quite a lot and that is uh, that we assume uh, partially because of this sort of new Kuznetsian kind of frame that we need to get more unequal before things can improve. And I think that comes from, from, from again this centralized and neoliberal is actually a subset of a growth paradigm which is all about concentration and building pyramids. And I send, and I, in my senses, and you know, we don't have empirical proof of this, uh, is that distributed structures will actually provide us completely different ways of addressing that question. So you don't really have to become structurally un, uh, unequal. And we've seen that. I mean, the data show that very clearly. In the last 15 years, inequality is increasing. Uh, and not only that, that even in our cities, some question that I work, work on, we are reproducing the same kind of um, caste, uh, um, gender, and other, other inequalities that have been perpetrated in rural India. So the last thing I'd leave you with is, at least in my view of things, you know, we are very focused, especially people who come from the technology domain, on the fact that technical and economic innovation is really what drives change. To my mind, over the next 30 or 50 years, the most important innovations we're going to have are social innovations. Uh, so social transformation is the central information, is the central transformation that will unlock India's potential around gender, around caste, around, uh, you know, a whole range of other asymmetries. And we have to look at it in that context. And that is something that's fought on a day-to-day -day basis in each of our households, in, you know, in, in each of our workplaces. And if we don't recognize that, we won't recognize the tremendous opportunity to make the change. So, what you about the, uh, you know, Mohammed Ansari, that story is a fantastic story. Uh, but it's happening in, in a hundred thousand places. It is just that uh, we have a system, yes, that completely rejects that and does not allow that to aggregate. And eventually teaches you at the age of 11 or 12, that you have to do all the work. इससे कुछ नहीं होगा आपका पेट नहीं भरेगा आप कुछ बड़े आदमी नहीं बना बनोगे अब तो क्यों बिल्ड सो आई स्टॉप दे थैंक यू